last week we began a brand new series in the book of Ephesians by talking about how the church of Ephesus started. And we went to Acts chapter 18 and 19 and talked about that church. I've got a comment on this beautiful piece of art that Gloria Popowitz put together this week. It is um, just this incredible piece that uh, really summarizes what the book of Ephesians is all about. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. And I hope that throughout this series we'll be challenged to be people who will live that out, that we'll say we want to be in this generation, 21st century imitators of Jesus Christ, that when people see us, they see him flowing through us. In Ephesus, it had been a long six years since Paul's departure from the church. I'm sure they missed their pastor and their mentor, the one who led many of them into a relationship with Jesus Christ. When Paul would leave behind these churches that he planted, oftentimes he left behind young pastors, some of them that were trained within the body of believers in that community. Sometimes they were companions with him that he he left there. Timothy would eventually become the chief pastor shepherd of the church at Ephesus, that young pastor, pastoral protege in Paul's life. But uh, he loved this church. And as he often did, Paul sent a letter to the people at Ephesus. And he does this in churches all over the, the ancient Near East world in Asia Minor. And we call them the epistles of Paul. That's, that's kind of what, what we, we call those letters. And when Paul would write these letters, they oftentimes included some encouragement for the church. Every good pastor wants to encourage those that uh, are underneath his care. There was a, a time in the letter that he would move from encouragement to equipping that group of believers to help them grow in their faith in Jesus Christ. And then oftentimes there was some correction for some dysfunctional things that were happening in the church. And we can just call it sin, all right? There was sin that was happening there, and Paul would oftentimes call that out to the people. In fact, the book of Philippians is the only book where he doesn't correct. Ephesians isn't Philippians, so there's going to be some correction in this book to this group of believers. The, the letter to this book includes uh, all these things, and, uh, and we're just going to dive into Ephesians chapter 1 today. So if you have your Bibles, open up there. We're going to park in verses 1 to 10 today, and it begins with verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus. And I want to begin by just pointing out a couple of things in this, just this verse, which I know for many of you is now going to be your life verse, right? I mean, there's nothing that says life verse like the introduction of one of Paul's letters. Um, there's no question from the beginning that Paul is the author of this letter. He identifies himself right away. But I love the way he identifies himself. He says, I'm Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. This book is going to introduce to us a number of deep theological concepts, not the least of which, and you're going to see it in these verses, you're going to see it throughout the book of Ephesians, is this concept of the mystery of the will of God. I mean, he is just blown away at the fact that God showered him with wonderful grace from the Lord Jesus Christ. Before Paul was a follower of Jesus, most of you know the story. He was a persecutor of Christians. He was somebody who hated this new way. He was actually the leader of the plan from the temple in Jerusalem to eliminate the threat to traditional Judaism. And so Paul's job was to represent the temple, to find bands of Christians, and to disperse them. He didn't kill every Christian, but he was there when the first Christian was martyred. He was there at the the martyrdom of Stephen. In fact, uh, Acts is very careful to say that he stood there and, and approved of everything that was going on. And so he was there to witness the first murder of a Christian. He persecuted Christians. And on his way to persecute Christians on the road to Damascus, Paul is blinded with this heavenly light And he hears a voice from heaven saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And some of you are going, wait a second, I thought you said this was Paul's story. Why are you calling him Saul? If you're you're new to the story, maybe you don't know that. Saul was Paul's name before he was a follower of Jesus. Saul was actually a descendant of King Saul. He was from the tribe of Benjamin. And if you remember the Old Testament story of King Saul, he was the first king of Israel. And he was picked as king, among other things, because he was the tallest member of the tribe of Benjamin. He was tall. In fact, the name Saul means tall. And the apostle Paul, before he was a Christian, lived like he was this 
tall, proud, boastful, I got it all together, man. He walked with great pride in his position, in his education, in his intellect. But when Saul met Christ, he changed his name to Paul, which means small. <laughs> the exact opposite of the name small. In fact, it even means mouse, okay? It's as small as a mouse. He's, he's the apostle mouse, all right? He is this small, small thing in front of the God of the universe. Paul's the perfect example, I think, of what Jesus said to uh, the Lord in John 3.30. He must increase, but I must decrease. Listen, if you want to be somebody that God uses in this generation, you need to be somebody who, like Jesus says in John 3.30, he must increase, I must decrease. And that was one of the secrets to Paul, even in his name change. I need to go from tall to small. I need to decrease so God can increase in me and use me. Paul writes that he's an apostle by the will of God. He knows that he would have never chosen this for his life. He's somebody that uh, was going the opposite way. Only God could have appointed somebody like Paul, a persecutor, a murderer, somebody who hated Jesus to become such a great leader in the early church. This letter is to all the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful to Jesus Christ. I wonder if you've taken hold of the fact that as a follower of Jesus, you today are a saint. You know, saint is one of those words that as Protestants, we don't use a lot, do we? And it's very rare that we talk about saints. Uh, we, we don't have saints in the Protestant church. As, as Protestant believers, um, I don't think we embrace the concept of being a saint enough. And Catholic churches oftentimes make it something that is too exclusive, too prestigious. Paul did something radical when he identified the Gentile believers as saints. This was a term that in the Old Testament was reserved for those who are members of the children of Israel, God's chosen people, the the Jewish people. Every time you see saints used in the Old Testament, it is used either for a Jewish person or it is used for an angel in heaven. Those are the only people who are described as saints or beings described as saints in the Old Testament. But Jesus takes that concept and tears the wall down. And then Paul trumpets Jesus' message. If you're a believer, Pauline theology, the theology that is taught by the Apostle Paul in all of his epistles, teaches that you are a saint. Now, I grew up in a town called St. Charles, Illinois. Uh, I love St. Charles. It was a a great place to grow up. I have no idea who St. Charles was. To this day, I don't know who the St. Charles that my town is named after, who who, who that man is. In fact, I went to Wikipedia last night because I felt so um, just uneducated as a a graduate of St. Charles High School not to know who the, the namesake of my town was. How did this not come up in history? Maybe I was sleeping that day. You know what I found out? There are eight St. Charles in Wikipedia, not cities. There's actually a whole lot more St. Charles, Missouri and Michigan and all sorts of places. But eight St. Charleses, the, the man in Wikipedia. There were a lot of guys named Charles who became saints. In fact, my town was named Charleston. And the, 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 the guys who, who founded St. Charles realized that Charleston was already a town in southern Illinois. So they just named the town St. Charles. It's really not named after any saint in particular. But here's the deal. I've got a friend named Chuck, and he is uh, one of, a really good friend of mine and a, a solid, godly believer in Jesus Christ. And I decided last night that from now on, when I think about St. Charles, I'm going to think about my friend, St. Chuck, all right? Because Chuck, as a follower of Jesus Christ, is somebody who in the eyes of God is a saint. So here's what I want you to do today. I want you to look at the person next to you, and I want you to say, Hello, my name is Saint, you know, whatever your name is. Okay, so hi, I'm Saint Brian. I'm Saint Greg. Nice to meet you, Saint Greg. All right, give that a try real quick. All right, just, just try it with the person next to you. I just feel like going, ha. Ah. <laughs> I mean, we've got uh, saints all over this place. All right, how'd that feel? How many said, that feels a little bit pretentious, Brian, all right? That, that, you know, that feels a little weird. Maybe something that I should say about something, somebody else, not myself. Uh, I don't feel worthy of that. 
Listen, if the book of Ephesians is going to teach us anything, it is that we have a high position in Christ. We have been blessed with him. We are saints, partakers in the mystery of the gospel and the blessings of God. But I'm getting ahead of myself here. Look at the end of verse 2. This letter is to all the saints who are in Ephesus who are what? What does it say? And are faithful in Christ Jesus. All right, so this is a letter that's being written to those who are followers of Jesus Christ and are faithful to him. I wonder what last week would have said about you. I wonder if uh, there was a videotape fo- camera following me around all week last week and, and, um, and it was shown here in church if, if you'd think I was a, a saint, all right? I wonder what, what the last week says about us. What if this letter was written to the saints who are at Woodbury Community Church who are faithful in Christ Jesus? How would you do on that? The first series that I preached at Woodbury Community Church when I became pastor here was a series on the fruit of the Spirit. And we talked about all of the different fruit of the Spirit and the fact that, you know, it really isn't an option for us to say, I want a little bit of love and a little bit of joy and a little bit of peace. Uh, that, that, you know, we, we're people that that fruit, it's all of those fruit at the same time developing in us, maybe at, at different levels. But these are the things that God produces in us. And I didn't get to preach the sermon on faithfulness. I was on vacation that week. David Olson, who was our, our worship director that week, preached his first sermon ever, preached on faithfulness. And I sat down with him and talked to him. But had I preached that week, I had it all planned out. And I was going to tell you that faithfulness is a character trait that we love to see in others. It's also something that we treasure. Because many of us have been burned by those in our life who are unfaithful. Maybe you've had that happen to you before been burned by somebody who promised to be faithful and they weren't. Solomon lamented the fact that there weren't enough faithful men in the book of Proverbs. Paul vowed to be a faithful man. Jesus called the church to be faithful. And the big idea that day was this, that faithfulness is following Jesus no matter the cost. And when Paul talked to these precious Christians in the town of Ephesus who were faithful to Jesus, he knew that it cost many of them something very dear to them to be followers of Jesus. Paul knew the scrutiny that these men and these women were under. Some of them had lost their only source of income because of being a follower of Jesus. Some of them were being persecuted by the people who had followed in the footsteps of Saul, the one who persecuted Christians, after he got out of the business because he'd been changed by God. Persecution didn't stop in the early church. Some of these Christians had um, found out that the cost of being a disciple of Jesus was immense in a city where it seemed like everyone was a disciple of the Greek goddess Artemis. Again, if you weren't with us last week, this was the town that was the center of the worship of a pagan goddess named Artemis. The town that contained one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, a temple that sat 24,000 people. Most of the town earned their income in some way from this worship of Artemis, a a religion that was practiced all over that part of the world. Today we think about Muslims making a a Mecca, a a pilgrimage to Mecca. People in that day who worshipped Artemis would make a pilgrimage to Ephesus to worship in her great temple. And there was much profit to be made. When I think of faithfulness in, in my life, the first thing that comes to my mind is marriage. I made a vow on the day that I got married to be faithful to my wife, and she made a vow to be faithful to me. And it's a vow that we take seriously. And it's a vow that, uh, that, that, that I don't want to ever break. And it's interesting to me that the Apostle Paul, when he writes about faithfulness, writes about faithfulness to those who were in Christ Jesus, not faithful to Christ Jesus. But here's what I mean. When I think about my marriage vows, I don't think about being faithful in Cindy. I think about being faithful to Cindy. Yet the Apostle Paul uses this word in instead of to because when it comes to being faithful in our relationship with Jesus, it is always in Christ Jesus and not to Christ Jesus because you can't be faithful to him if you aren't allowing him to abide in you. Does Jesus Christ abide in you? Because if he doesn't, If you aren't walking in this abiding, life-giving relationship with Jesus Christ, it's going to be impossible for you to live a life that's faithful to him. Jesus talked about that in John 15, 4 and 5. He said, Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. 
I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Paul knew that the Christians at Ephesus would need to be reading and applying the truths of this letter. And that those who were, were the ones who were abiding in Christ. Faithfulness to Christ requires that we abide in him and he in us. Look at verse 2. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This was Paul's standard greeting, which offered something that every one of us crave in our relationship with Jesus. How many of you would say today that I'm in need of God's grace in my life every day? Is that true of you? Yeah. How many of you would say, I could sure use God's peace on this snowy Sunday morning in April? (laughs) Yeah, we need his peace. We need his love and we need it every day. And how many of you would say that that uh, that's just that's so true. I mean, notice what Paul says that comes from. It comes from God, our father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The answer to everything that we so futilely search for here on earth is found in the arms of our Heavenly Father and His precious Son, Jesus. Now look at verses 3 and 4, because Paul's going to flesh that out. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him. When I was a kid... Uh, my family went to a church that was as, about as far away from being a charismatic church as, as you can get. And my oldest brother decided he wanted to try something new. And so he, didn't, he got tired of our home church, decided he was going to rebel. Isn't that funny? He was going to rebel by going to church. So he, he rebelled by going to a charismatic church service. And my parents were scared to death of these, this charismatic church. And, uh, and I remember my brother uh, begging his parents and, and siblings to come with him one Sunday to church. And I was maybe in fifth or sixth grade. And so we went to this church, and it was unlike anything I'd ever, ever experienced before in church. When the, when the preacher was praying, everybody in the church was praying. And so the pastor would start praying, and all of a sudden, everybody in the church is, is praying. And some of the people prayed in a language that I didn't understand. And some of the people prayed really loud. And some of the people prayed with, with grunts and girls. And I was absolutely confused. And there was a term that I, I kept hearing over and over again in this church, though. As the people were praying, I kept hearing these people say, Bless you, Father. Bless you, Lord. Bless you, Jesus. And I thought, well, isn't God already blessed? I mean, I don't get this. Why do they keep shouting, Bless you, God. Bless you, Father. Bless you. Because in my young theology, what God was was somebody that was some cosmic genie in the sky who was supposed to bless me. So why would God want us to say, Bless you, God. Bless you, Father. I, he was supposed to heal me when I was sick and give me grace and peace that we talked about a moment ago. It was all about what could God do for me. But the blessing of God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places happens when we take hold of the blessings in Christ that he has for us by abiding in him. We are instructed in scripture to bless God. We bless God by living holy and blameless lives before him, which, by the way, is impossible. Now, that's the problem, isn't it? Because we're told to bless God. And how many of you this week have lived a holy and a blameless life? Your pastor hasn't. Okay? So we're in trouble. (laughs) Because if that's what blessing God's about, we can't do it. But what is impossible with man is possible with God. It is God who sets the captives free. It is God who takes the broken life and restores it. It is God who forgives our sin. It is God who makes us holy and blameless by placing the perfect righteousness of Christ upon us. God takes impossibly broken people, impossibly broken people, like the Apostle Paul, like me, like you, and he blesses us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. When we bless God by allowing Christ to be preeminent in us, we bless God by allowing Christ to do his work in us. Verse 3 tells us that God the Father has blessed us in Christ, and it's speaking about a past event. Speaking about something that's already happened. And we just need to grab hold of that truth. Romans 5, 8 says, But God shows his love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The fact that Christ went to the cross for us in our place before we were born, knowing that you and me would be stuck in sin with a God who requires that we live a holy and a blameless life, 
shows God's incredible love for humanity. I think it's important to note here where, where our spiritual blessings are stored. He's blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And therein lies another one of our problems. So many of us are consumed with experiencing blessing on earth that we forget that this world isn't our eternal home. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 19 to 21, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. When Jesus Christ is our treasure, we understand that our spiritual blessings never going to be found in this earth. It's always going to be found in him. When Jesus is our treasure, we begin to understand something else. We begin to understand that we're his treasure. That you and I are the treasure of God. Verse 4 tells us that he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Jesus has been thinking about you for eternity. My wife and kids discovered a show on Netflix that I know many of you have probably seen at one point or another called White Collar a few weeks back. And I think I'd seen it once or twice in my life, but uh, they really got into one of the seasons of it. And and I joined them uh, watching that and kind of got caught up in it too. The show centers around this FBI agent who uh, has captured a a world-renowned thief, an art thief. His job, the, the FBI guys, is to put away art thieves and to take care of white-collar crime. But he gets in over his head in a case, and he's got to make this plea deal with this art thief that he caught to try to catch an art thief who he can't catch. And uh, so pretty soon, uh, the art thief is helping the FBI agent, and they're capturing art thieves and counterfeiters all over the world. But there's this ongoing temptation in the life of the art thief. He knows where one of the world's greatest treasure troves is. It's an old Nazi ship full of valuable artwork. And you know what? He can't stop thinking about it. It is this temptation that is before him all the time, and it consumes him. Listen, Jesus can't stop thinking about us. We consume him, and we have since before we were born. He is absolutely consumed with you. Psalm 139, 13 to 16 says, For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret, intricately woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet, none were, when as yet was none of them. If you go on to 17 and 18 in the Living Bible, it says, how precious to me, Lord, are your thoughts. How vast is the sum of them. I I can't even count the number of times you think about me every day. If I tried to, they would outnumber the sands and the shore and the stars in the sky. It's an infinite number of times that God thinks about each one of us every day. All right, so we've got a God who loves us and as his sons and daughters has lavished some blessings on us. Number one, We've been adopted as sons and daughters of God. Look at verses 5 and 6. In love, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. I love that our church is a church that values adoption. Many of you have children who are adopted. Maybe you've been adopted yourself. Just yesterday, Cindy and I were at the Mall of America, and we ran into our former neighbor in Eden Prairie, Uh, he was the son of the people who owned the house next to us and was only there for a couple of years when we were there. And then he grew up and got married and we went to his wedding and uh, witnessed that beautiful occasion. Just this wonderful guy. And he and his wife, um, I found out yesterday, have struggled with infertility for a number of years. And so they decided they were going to adopt. And they tried adopting five times, four times before they were finally successful in adopting their son. Uh, It was a U.S. adoption, and in our country, the mother has the right to, within 48 hours in the states that they were in, it's two weeks here in Minnesota, say that I I changed my mind. And four times the mother changed their mind in them. Two times when they were at the hospital with their child. The The baby was born, the baby was put into their arms, and 47 hours later, grandma came in and said, we want the baby. And it was this heartbreaking experience for them. But then with a twinkle in his eyes, he introduced me to his son in 
the um, stroller that he was carrying. And he said, Brian, it cost $50,000 for us to go through the adoption when we had all these failures in adoption. And he said, but it was worth every penny. And he said, my wife's due with twins <laughs> next week. <laughs> and so <laughs> they've got two more on the way. But there's something beautiful about being an adopted son or daughter. See, God values us so much as his sons and daughters. There's some blessings, too, that are shown in verses 7 and 8. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. We've been redeemed. If you're a child of God, you have been redeemed. Redemption is the payment of a ransom. It literally means to buy another's freedom. Christ has done that for you. One of my modern-day heroes is a guy named Gary Haugen who runs the International Justice Mission. Haugen had an incredibly lucrative law career that he left to become a rescuer of victims of human trafficking. His organization has literally brought freedom to thousands of young girls and boys and women around the world. And there is nothing like the videos of seeing these people freed and then seeing, hearing the stories of them a year later or two years later as they talk about what it was like to be a slave whose freedom has been given to them. If you're a believer, you were once a slave to sin. But redemption means that you have been set free, that your freedom has been purchased by the blood of Christ. Kent Hughes tells a wonderful story in his commentary on Ephesians to demonstrate this point. He says, In a city on the shore of a great lake lived a small boy who loved water and sailing. So deep was his fascination that he, with the help of his father, spent months making a beautiful model boat, which he began to sail at the water's edge. One day a sudden gust of wind caught the tiny boat and carried it far into the lake and out of sight. Distraught, the boy returned home, and he was inconsolable. Day after day, he'd go to the lake as he was at the lake, would search in vain for his boat, couldn't find it. And then one day, as he was walking through the town, there in the window of one of the shop owners was a beautiful boat. In fact, it was his boat in the window. So he approached the owner and he said, that's my boat. I own it. I made it. Only to be told that it wasn't his, for the owner had paid a local fisherman good money for the boat. If the boy wanted the boat back, he'd have to pay the price. And so the boy went home and he set himself to work doing anything and everything until he finally returned to the store and he purchased the boat that he had made himself. And at last, holding that boat in his arms, he said with great joy, you are twice mine now because I made you and because I bought you. That's what Jesus does for us. That's what redemption is. Next blessing we have is that we've been forgiven. There's nothing that can compare to what it feels like to be given complete and absolute forgiveness. It's something that those of us who have experienced um, that can, can, can tell you for the rest of our lives, we're, we're blown away by it. And those who've never experienced the grace and the freedom of forgiveness can hardly comprehend it. The forgiveness that Scripture speaks about when it comes to God and man is always absolute and without condition. Look at Rome, Psalm 103.12. For as far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions for us. Isaiah 44.22. I have blotted out your transgressions like a cloud and your sins like mist. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. Jeremiah 31.34. For I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. Micah 7, 19, he will again have compassion on us. He will tread on our iniquities. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. You will cast all of our sins into the depths of the sea. Matthew 26, 28, for this is the blood of my covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. In 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's the forgiveness that God offers the Apostle Paul considered himself the chiefest of sinners. He says, I was the worst of the worst. And Christ's complete and absolute forgiveness is one of the greatest gifts that we've been given. Like the Apostle Paul, if you've experienced Christ's salvation, you have been forgiven. I wonder if you've thanked Jesus lately for how freely he's forgiven you 
Next gift he, we've been given is we have been shown extravagant grace. Look at the end of verse 7, the beginning of 8. According to his rich, the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us. God could have chosen to give to us from his riches. That's not what this verse says. It doesn't say God gave to us from his riches. It says he gave to us according to his riches. That's the difference between a billionaire saying to you, I'm going to take pity on this poor person who's got so many bills due. I'm going to write you a check for $100. And they give you that check, and yeah, you're grateful for it. And you can pay part of your electric bill with that. (laughs) And it's gone. And a God who says, or a billionaire who says, hey, I'm going to take care of all your bills. And I'm going to take care of that house payment for the next several years. Does the person deserve that grace? No. Did they work for it? No. But see, that's what God gives us. He gives us according to his riches, which he lavished upon us. Remember the hymn, Amazing Grace, when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun? We've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Eternity is experiencing the lavish grace of God every day, forever. And we're never going to get used to it. All right, number five, we've been given spiritual discernment. Last one, verse eight concludes with the words, in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth for us in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things into him, things in heaven and things on earth. I could preach for three hours on that one, I won't. In other words, our redemption, forgiveness, and grace have been given to us along with the gift of spiritual discernment. We can see the world with God's eyes as Christians. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, we can begin to understand God's heart. Not only that, but the mystery of God's will becomes clear to us. Here's the deal. One day, Christ is going to unite all things unto himself. This world, as imperfect as it is, is not just a bunch of random people making random decisions. We are people who have been created by God. Our God has a plan. His plan includes the restoration of everything unto himself. That doesn't mean that everyone's going to go to heaven, all right? It's not what that's talking about. But it does mean that our God is in the process of pruning. He's in the process of weeding. He's in the process of restoring. He is in the process of taking creation and bringing everything under the lordship of Jesus Christ. And one day, Philippians 2, 9 through 11, this is going to happen. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every other name. So that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. At Woodbury Community Church, we believe that the incredible blessings that come from being sons and daughters of God are worth sharing with the world. It's why we do what we do. It's about sharing the mystery of the gospel. It's about making disciples around the world. Today, John and Catherine Kimball are going to share a brief faith story here at the end of this message about something that God has been revealing to them about sharing this beautiful message with others. John, come on up to Catherine. Ryan's been talking about um, following Jesus no matter what. That's kind of been our life story. Um, Catherine and I met when I was in seminary. She was in Bible college. I fell in love with her the very first day I saw her during orientation. It took me a year and a half to convince her she was in love with me, but <laughs> she's a slow learner. <laughs> and uh, shortly after we got married, about a year or so after we got married, we received a call to a little country church in the peanut fields of Suffolk, Virginia. We've, some of us have talked about this before. It was 17 miles from the nearest fire hydrant. And I say I, I have proof of that because the house insurance documents for the parsonage said fire hydrant, 17 miles. It was that far away. And uh, we went kicking and screaming because that wasn't what we had in mind. We were uh, assistant, I was an assistant pastor at a suburban church in Chesapeake, Virginia. It was an up-and-coming neighborhood, an up-and-coming church. Things were going great. We thought this is where we're going to serve. And the Lord had a different idea. That turned out to be a roller coaster ride of 15 years, but probably one of the best ministry experiences a pastor could ever have. 
And when we finally got to a place with that church where it was a congregation we desperately loved and, and wanted to serve right through to retirement, God gave us a different invitation. And that was to come to the frozen tundra of Minnesota, <laughs> where it snows even on April 14th. And uh, we weren't so sure, but we knew it was the hand of God because, and, and if any of you, you ever, anybody ever read Oswald Chambers, uh, My Utmost for His Highest? Uh, I would suggest, if you want to know part of our story, that you take a look at the August 1st reading because we were sitting at a table uh, overlooking the Choan River on August 1st in a personal retreat time, really praying about, Lord, is this what you would have us do? And the August 1st reading made it abundantly clear where God spoke through Oswald Chambers and said, uh, if you don't go, you're being disobedient. And we'll just leave it at that. You can, you can read that in your own time. And so we came up here, and this has been an incredible uh, ride for us. Uh, my first boss, Steve Gammon, dear friend, great guy to work with. Second boss, a little crazier, but uh, also a great guy to work with. And of course, Ron and I have been friends for 20 some odd years and, and uh, just really appreciate the time with him. But God is now moving us on to another adventure. And once again, it's one that we did not expect. Catherine and I, uh, about a year or so from now, 18 months from now, will be planting a church. And uh, it could be that this is the fulfillment of part of the Reach 15. I'll let Brian talk maybe a little bit about that. But uh, it's not going to be in Stillwater. It's going to be in Orlando, Florida. And uh, it's part of a, a wider vision that the, the Four Seas has. But as God began to whisper in my heart about this, um, once again, I was pushing back against it, saying, well, I'm not a pioneering spirit. I'm, I'm the guy that takes care of churches that are on the other end of the life spectrum, not the birth end of the, the life spectrum. And, uh, and God has said, no, I'm changing that for you. Uh, most of you know that, that Catherine is from Georgia, uh, and most of you know that I grew up in Michigan. What you may not know is that my parents moved to Florida in 1978, and so while I am from the Detroit area, the place that I have called home most since graduating high school uh, is actually Central Florida. And so it's, it's kind of like going home for us. Um, there is no, we've known for quite a while that there is no 4C presence in the southeast. Of the 10 southeastern United States, there are seven churches total, and they stop in North Carolina. So on the, the um, eight southernmost states, there is no 4C presence whatsoever except for a few retirees who happen to live in Florida. Uh, back in July of last year, God began whispering in my heart about church planting, and I, I couldn't then fathom what he was doing. And if he had told me what it was going to become, I wouldn't have believed him anyway, probably. But uh, it has slowly unfolded over the, the last several months, and the two of us have come to the conclusion that this really is the Lord speaking to us once again. Um, the Board of Directors of the Four C's has been considering possible changes to the Four C ministry structure for quite a while. Those changes are going to really impact my position, and so the timing of this actually is God, and uh, will allow me to continue working with the Four C's even as that my ministry changes. They're, they're really decentralizing and making the ministries of the Four C's much more regional so they can be more effective. And so putting me out in a church actually works better for what they're, they're talking about doing. And then uh, the Four C's also has been talking for a long time about expanding strategically into areas where we do not have a presence, uh, and while at the same time increasing our uh, vital investment into areas where we're already strong, and that includes the Southeast and the Southwest. And so this would be a part of that as well. Um, Orlando is a city, just real quickly, people think of Donald and Mickey and golf and all kinds of things, but they don't see the city with spiritual eyes. Um, Orlando is in the bottom third, called one of the least Bible-minded cities in the United States, with only 25% of its population believing that the Bible is even accurate, and even less looking at it every single week. 67% of the population in Orlando have no Christian faith involvement at all. Zero. Uh, it's, yet it's the fourth fastest growing metropolitan area in the United States, experiencing 34% increase in its population since 2000 and it's expected to have another 8% in the next five years. Based on the number of groups living in Orlando, the, the racial and ethnic diversity is very high. 44% of the population is non-white, and from many of that, much of that is from other countries. And so it's just as cosmopolitan as many of the nation's largest cities. And in fact, Rob O'Neill, who's our church planter in Shakopee, 
grew up in Central Florida, and he said that Orlando is just as cosmopolitan as Los Angeles, California, just on a smaller scale. And yet, this city is largely unreached with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so, we're going. Our affinities, as we went through our assessment process, are for young adults, college age, young families with children, and senior adults. We've got a lot of experience with, with all of those, and so we're going to be focusing on those as we go down there. There are nine major universities in Orlando, Florida, and so it's very likely we will plop down next to one of those universities. And if you would pray with us, we're cu currently kind of considering, although it has not been decided yet, the University of Central Florida, because one of the things we found is with that particular university, there, there's, there appears to be no Christian witness to that university right now with InterVarsity or Campus Crusade or any of those kinds of things. So that's probably where we will land, but that's not decided yet. A lot of things uh, still to come. Uh, we're asking, we're inter asking for intercessor prayer, intercessors to pray for us. We now have 43 prayer warriors praying for us nationwide, but that uh, number can certainly always increase. We're currently doing a thorough demographic study of the area. Pretty soon we'll start our formal church planting proposal for the National 4C Church Planting Team. And then we'll be recruiting team members with the right temperaments, gifts, and strengths to join us. We would like to land with a team of about 30 people so we have a church in place. And we hit the ground running about 18 to 24 months from now. And uh, some of those may come from Woodbury Community Church. The invitation will certainly be given. We met with the, uh, the Board of Directors, Board of Elders, this uh, last Thursday, and they gave their blessing to this project and uh, have agreed that Woodbury Community Church will be our sending church, and we're very excited about that and humbled by that. So there will be much more news to come. If you'd like more information on what we're doing, you'd like to be a part of the prayer team, um, Catherine's email address is on the front of the bulletin. Just shoot her a quick email saying you'd like more information, and we can send you some documentation. We have... Uh, a document that I'm going to be handing out to our group at, during the adult ed time about the vision for the church plant that gives a lot more details than we've done up here. But we appreciate your, your partnership in this and your prayers as we go on. And um, WCC is still going to be our home church. We're just going to be living in a different spot. And for those that are concerned about losing the director of children's ministries, <laughs> she's still going to be here full time, you know, working like she is now uh, for the next 18 months or so until we actually have a launch date. And then we'll we'll give more time at that. So, Ryan. All right.